We learn in time, buildings learn in time, most conspicuously, cities learn in time. But often, a city isn't allowed to learn. It's so locked up by planning laws that paralyze adaptability. The most freeing places to live are where the town has grown organically, gradually, responding spontaneously to the life in it. This is the opposite of a central thesis of urban planning, which is to predict, control, separate, and zone. I'm lucky enough to live in a neighborhood where zoning has broken down, partly because it's on the border between city and county jurisdictions. A couple of decades back, what had been zoned as a light industrial waterfront area in Sausalito, California, was invaded by illegal residential houseboats such as mine, eventually over 400 of them, now mostly legal. The result is mildly scruffy and utterly convenient and neighborly. From my door, it's a short walk, not only to my office, but to public storage, auto repair, boat supplies, bike supplies, office supplies, a gym, a tire service, a supermarket, a deli, and seven restaurants, all in the low rent, malleable part of town. I visit friends in nice homes elsewhere, and it feels as if they live in a desert, zoned out of a walkable way of life stuck in a place where nothing ever changes. For most of the 20th century, the basic scheme of city planners was to keep functions and classes separate. Zoning was introduced in Berkeley in 1914 and New York City in 1916 to protect residential neighborhoods from commerce, industry, and undesirable immigrants. Very quickly, legal barriers clattered into place all over the cities. Residential would be there, and there, commercial center here, industrial out there somewhere. There would be no more unsanitary, high-density living areas. And there really had been health problems. There would be no more mixed living and working. There had been nightmare sweatshops, and sometimes still are. And no more melting pot. Cities would be physically stratified according to economic class, creed, and race. Zoning must have worked to some degree since it has lasted so long. In America, half the population now lives in suburbs, and only one in ten in a conventional city. Britain is heading rapidly in the same direction. People either can't afford to live in the city, or they're buying what they believe is a safe haven away from the perceived hazards of urban life. Originally, we lived in the inner cities, and it we did feel it was unsafe. It wasn't a place I was comfortable to be in. And really, my ambition was to move out into a more middle-class environment, a safe environment, somewhere that my children could go to school and feel that they're going to be brought up with middle-class values. That, you know, there's no other way to put it. Obviously, I had my dream of how the house would look, ideally, but it was really the secondary dream. The first dream was to get away, to get space, to get quality of life, to get to somewhere that I felt would give my children something a little bit more than I could see in the inner cities. A building is the interface between two human organizations, the intense group within and the larger, slower, more powerful community outside. It may be your house, but in most places you can't do what you want with it. Agencies such as the Planning Board, Design Review Board, and Developer's Office have a say in how your house looks and even how it can be used. At their worst, these regulators stifle originality 
block adaptivity and defy reason. In Kent, Jasper Knight wasn't allowed to paint his gray house blue. He didn't know this, so he did. But then he had to change it back to gray again to suit the local authorities. One of the council's reasons for turning down the color was that it was too dominant. Well, what could be more dominant than an eight foot long red cow and a bright canary yellow, I ask you. I personally think it looked better blue. And after all, it's my house. Why should I not have it blue? It's only going to be blue for a few years. It hasn't altered it in any way. It's just a matter of taste. In Devon, Trevor Sedgebear had endless problems with his local council over what he could and couldn't do with his own land. We lived in a mobile home. Um, and we were all right whilst it was a small council. But when the council amalgamated into a much bigger council, and that's when we had the problems. And from then onwards, we had planning battle after planning battle over the mobile home, which in the end we lost and the court orders to take it down and by then we had built a barn here which is this spot here behind me which we then converted into somewhere to live as a home because we've been made homeless. It cost Mr. Sedgebear 40,000 pounds to convert his barn. The council didn't like it because it was for domestic use rather than agricultural and they ordered him to reduce it to ground level. Sedgebear responded by covering the top half with 500 tons of soil and continued living there underground. In effect, we buried the building so they couldn't tell that we still had a home here. When the forcing officer came to inspect the site, we were still working on it, a friend of mine from up the road came down with his wife, and as soon as she looked in the site, with the forcing officer still here, she said the bugger's buried it, that's what he's done. She spotted it right away, but the forcing officer never spotted it. When the council discovered what Sedgebear had done, he ended up in court and then in prison because he refused to demolish his barn. He was released only when his desperate son-in-law finally knocked the barn down. The progress from illegal to legal usage is worth study because it shows how a community learns from its buildings. A few years back, I lived inexpensively in this tiny cottage in an extremely affluent place called Belvedere, California. Two local women were pressuring the city council to register and tax all the town's second units, such as my cottage, and outlaw all new ones. Second units are separate little buildings or extensions that are added later, often without permission. Like most towns, Belvedere has no end of them. At the last minute before the new ordinance was passed, front page coverage in a local paper brought the biggest crowd in memory here to a city council meeting. The two women sat rigid while the whole town explained in detail that second units were the salvation of Belvedere. They gave families the flexibility to stay in their homes because there was a place for the aging parent, the au pair, the growing teenager. They provided affordable housing to city staff and local employees, the town's whole support population. This financially and socially brittle community was made broader and more adaptive by second units. Don't outlaw them, help them. The Belvedere Council unanimously reversed its ruling. All around the industrialized world are new commercial centers that have escaped urban planning. Writer Joel Garreau calls them edge cities. Just outside Washington, D.C., Tyson's Corner is one of the largest of this new breed of city. Within three miles of its center, it has more than 21 million square feet of office space and 83,000 people living there. What you're looking at here is the culmination of millions of individual value decisions on the part of people trying to determine how they wanted to work and play and live 
and socialize and pray and die. None of this was created by some enormous plan. This is bubble up city. This is a city that was created ad hoc by millions of people deciding how they best wanted to live their lives. Tyson's was created here because it's at the intersection of three major roads, one of which is the famous Washington Beltway. It's also between two major airports, the international airport in this direction and national, the local airport over here. And then finally, this is a creation of the computer because this area of Northern Virginia is where the internet was invented. So many internet companies operate here that they call it the Netplex. This is a 21st century city. This is a product of the information age. And as a result, it's not so bad living near your work. In fact, people view that as desirable. The first law of Edge City is that the commute for the chief executive officer always goes down. And so as a result, the closer you get to the center of one of these Edge Cities, the more likely you are to find affluent people who are willing to pay extra in order to have a minimal commute. Here, the rich people live close to the center, and it's the poor people who live farther away. That's exactly the opposite of the old city centers or the old downtowns, where the affluent try to stay away, and what's left over is the places for the poor. Not all planning prevents change. Inspired planning encourages change that grows with the people. In Waterloo, London, residents took on the local councillors and developers and gained control of their own part of the city. They carefully planned what they needed in their area and how they were going to fund it. They formed Coin Street Community Builders, acquired 13 acres of land, and organized it around their needs. They've built new houses, refurbished a warehouse, Oxo Tower Wharf, and created space for two restaurants, art and craft workshops, and high-quality flats. The rent from the restaurants and workshops helps repay the loan used to build the houses. It's been remarkably successful. Not just anyone can live here, though. To qualify, you have to be in serious need of rehousing, be a low-paid worker providing an essential service to inner London, and have strong links with the area. I lived locally. I grew up. Um, in the area, I have family that live in the area, and um, I just kind of stood back and watched this amazing growth um, of the people around here saying no to offices, saying no that they didn't want a horrible living environment. And they just empowered themselves and formed this group called Coin Street to take charge of, an air, of this area and to in, try and get public money and private money to invest to make it work. And as a child, I grew up watching this and um, uh, my mum was one of the people that went along to a number of the meetings. I have neighbours who I live near who also went to meetings to help make that possible. We control our own budget. We collect our own rents. We decide to evict people if they're behind rents. We improve our homes with the money that we have. It's about not just surviving, but actually thriving in the environment that you call your home. Um, that's what it is for me. Um, it took about 10 years of campaigning um, for us to actually get hold of the, the land. We started in a situation where we had big private developers wanting to build over a million square foot of offices here and yet we wanted this site you know for housing for park for shops and for the sort of things that if you like have been squeezed out by central London pressures and it, it took about 10 years to convince um, you know the planners to give us planning permission and then to actually buy the land and after that we then um, obviously have the long period where you have to demolish 
the old buildings that uh, have got no further use. Um, Loud, new park, new river walk, um, build new housing, refurbish the buildings that can have a useful life in the future. So um, it takes quite a long time. This is an area where um, people enjoy living. It, it's right close to the centre of London. There is a good community. People know other people around. They may have had family living here for several generations. And that's something rare in the centre of London. Sometimes you can come out of Waterloo Station and it looks a bit seedy, it looks a bit dirty. Um, the shops are not up to much. Um, but actually it's the community that's at the heart of it that really makes it worthwhile. Carol and Gordon Tom and their two children were living in one room until they managed to convince Coin Street community builders of their need. When we heard about these houses going up, we, we just couldn't believe it. And we knew, we knew that everybody would, would be applying to, to get one of these houses and we just couldn't believe that there wouldn't be people more cramped than us, even though it was hard to believe that there could be, but we knew there's probably somebody living in a telephone box or something like that, and uh, <laughs> ten of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're looking we around. did a lot of praying. We did a lot of praying, I suppose, yeah, and, uh, and, and working out, uh, could there possibly be anybody that's like... That's amazing. That, that, when we first got shortlisted, I came in <laughs> to one of the directors in the shortlisted, <laughs> and I felt like I couldn't get this grin off my face, and I had to go and find him in the cafe. <laughs> And I can always remember that. We got shortlisted. Uh, I could, I kept going like this, trying to get the grin off my face. <laughs> Most people start off normally if they live in the inner city in a flat. Everybody, is, well, not everybody, but most people aspire to have that that house and that little garden. And, that, and normally, the only way you can get it is to move out and buy one. It was our first place with our own tenancy, with our own name, where we was responsible looking after it and to us it was a palace and it still is really I mean it's I, I, I defy anybody like no matter what 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 their uh, uh, social or income background to deny that these these are these are not brilliant places and I, 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 for the first year I still feel and, and every so often we st I still look around and I look around me and think Christ this is like you know it's our place like a roof over our head and, uh, and you get people say you would you would you like to buy it and all that? Well, but my own attitude is you can't take the place with you, so there's, 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 there's not a great problem there. And they say, well, wouldn't you want to leave it to your kids and all that? Well, you wouldn't be leaving it to your kids. They'd probably sell it, and, and, that, and that would destroy the whole ethos behind it, which is to provide affordable housing for people like ourselves. A building leads three contradictory lives as a component of the surrounding community, as habitat, and as property. If you view your house primarily as a home, you'll adapt it, and it will become gradually ever more interesting. If you view it strictly as property, just an investment, it will become ever more standard to meet the imagined desires of potential buyers. Seeking to be anybody's house, it becomes nobody's. All the years of life in the house wind up meaning nothing. Architect Chris Alexander has been rethinking the use of money in buildings. He'd like to see you make the years you spend in a house really work for you, both financially and adaptively. Build as and when you can afford it. What is it that costs the most in housing? I mean, is it the plumbing? Is it the foundation? Is it the wall? Is it the windows? The roof? You know. Okay. Well, actually, the answer is it's the mortgage. <laughs> uh, because um, roughly speaking, the amount of money that's paid for a building under sort of today's so-called normal conditions is about three times the construction cost. So that two-thirds of what you pay is interest, and one-third is the actual carcass, is the actual building. So if you say, look, we want to reduce the cost of housing, the one thing you want to do more than anything else is to, is to get rid of the mortgage. And you say, well, how could you do that? How can you get rid of that? And the answer, of course, is um, by only building with the money that you've got. His solution is to build your house gradually over time. Mortgages are an interestingly mixed issue. 
What's good about mortgages is that they make ownership easier and people take good care of what they own. But mortgages often overstretch people. It's far better to buy wisely and remodel to add value. Christina Wilson bought her house in North London for less than the market value and used the spare money to decorate it to her own individual taste. This is the second house that I've done up. We've always bought properties which needed doing up, not structurally, but maybe the whole interior needed gutting and restarting again. And we've always done them to our taste. We've done everything the way that we've wanted them within kind of financial means and the possibilities of doing them. But we've managed to achieve a look that we feel comfortable and within our budget at the time. Each kind of year we think of a job we need doing in the house and we change it again to suit our living needs. We actually just started by taking everything out and putting everything back in to a basic way to which we liked it. What happened with the last flat was there were actually lots of flats in the street for sale, but because of the way the flat looked and the way it was finished, people were actually fighting to buy the house at a price which was above the market value. In reality, everything we've done increases the value and the look of the property because you're always improving. You're either maximizing more space or you're actually increasing the, the value of the property by making it much more practical. So doing houses to your personal taste is a very good way of making money. The flow of money through and around a building acts to organize that building. Will the building be organized around the moment of sale or the decades of use? The same goes for cities. Will they be organized around quick buck markets and brittle theories or around the steady accumulation of wisdom, utility, and delight? Planners the world over take inspiration from Venice. But Venice was never planned. It's a monument to a more dynamic process. This place evolved, far from a unified design, it is a glorious mishmash of different periods and styles and ideas, all layered together. It works because each new addition was made with respect for what was done before. I live in Venice because of the physical beauty and because of the pace of life here. The pace of life in Venice is exceedingly comfortable, uh, wonderfully slow, we don't have cars in the city. Uh, subsequently, we're not exposed to uh, a frantic pace. We're not exposed to sort of the freneticism that the technological age um, has engulfed us in. There's a casuality of um, existence here, which is very, very nice. I mean, you have to be able to let yourself go to a certain degree. Everything that you see here was brought by man. Uh, the stones, the bricks, there are absolutely no indigenous building materials to Venice. It was a swamp. So what that means is that all that you're seeing in Venice is human fantasy. Count Francesco de Mostra grew up in Venice. 
His family's palazzo is right in town, on a street that also houses the local baker and shoe repairer. It is like a point of reference. There is always a place where you can come back and there is the silence. It's mm -hmm. like an island that is an idea, the island that is, doesn't exist. But always in the mind, the thing I'm coming to Venice, I come to the quiet place where at, everything... At night we don't have any noise at all, nothing. The only noise we hear is people in the street. Or far away when there is the fog, we listen to the to. too. It's a human scale town, so buildings, those buildings have people in front of them, not you know, wide streets with pavements, with cars. So you see everything in a human proportion, which makes a big difference. You also know exactly how long it's going to take you to go from one place to another. If you're in a big city and you need to go from one point to another, you never know what you might encounter if the bus is held up in traffic. Here the vaporettos go like clockwork. You can set your clock to, the, to when you see the vaporettos. But mostly, once you know the city really well, you can just walk and you know exactly how long it's going to take your own two feet to get you somewhere. And the extraordinary thing about Venice is that you can be sitting somewhere and talking about somebody and yet you might be saying, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so for about, you know, for ages. I wonder what's become of them. And chances are that within five minutes they'll walk past. Like the devil, when you're <laughs> speaking of the devil. Next week, we look at what happens when buildings go wrong and the seemingly boring but absolutely essential romance of maintenance. Buildings are destroyed before your eyes. Intrepid heroes battle entropy.